I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is John Scalero. I'm an orthopedic trauma surgeon at the University of California, Irvine. I'll be talking today about the treatment of diaphyseal nine unions with a magnetic nail through compression. I'd like to thank New Basis Specialized Orthopedics for sponsoring this. Uh, and with regard to uh, disclosures, this is a uh, sponsored talk. So let's get right into things. So the objectives of my talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about generalized non-union principles that I think are quite familiar to all of us, but I think are worth going over, especially in the case of um, a new technique or a new technology uh, in terms of treating some of these non-unions. I'm gonna summarize a little bit of the literature that exists out there with regard to use of compression nailing uh, and non-unions and take you through at least my thought process and kind of how I got on to um, treating nine unions uh, with the magnetic nail. Establish some indications for the technique, at least uh, specifically for my usage of this. Uh, as we all know, there's multiple ways of addressing the different types of nine unions that exist, but at least give you a framework to start uh, using yourself with regard to compression nailing, and then present some demonstrative cases. And I have a, a few that I think will exhibit some very good points. And I've tried to utilize some of the ones that have uh, good fluoroscopic images that accompany them to show you uh, the technique in detail. So with regard to compression, uh, we know the ways that fractures heal. And especially when we're talking about uh, acute fractures, acute fractures uh, that are compressed uh, provided absolute stability and primary bone healing. And we can accomplish that through screws or plates. And we use this primarily for the articular surface and simple fracture patterns, say for example, a transverse humeral shaft fracture or a, a simple radial shaft or ulnar shaft fracture, um, utilizing compression technique either through lag screws or compression plating. And so uh, this is one of the, the hallmarks of our fracture treatment. Even when we do have transverse or simple fracture patterns in long bones, especially in the tibia or femur, we're util utilizing an intramedullary nail for these diaphyseal fractures. Now, as opposed to uh, compression that's generated, plates or screws, intramedullary nail is a relative stability contract. It always provides relative stability, uh, heals by secondary bone healing, callus formation, but does give us the benefit of providing immediate weight bearing for the vast majority of these fractures, especially when they're in the diaphyseal area. In addition, it's a primarily a percutaneous technique and the results show it's a very successful technique, especially for closed fractures. So closed fractures of the femur and closed fractures of the tibia have a very high success rate with regard to uh, healing on the first attempt. Unfortunately, non-unions do occur and they're relatively rare. Again, for diaphyseal fractures, less than 10% of all fractures, especially those that are closed, uh, go on to non-union. And I think when you're looking at a situation that in which the bone has failed to heal, you have to think about the factors. And so is there biology that's lacking? Is there a potential infection that's present? Uh, is there bone loss from a traumatic injury in an open fracture? How's the alignment doing? Because sometimes just the alignment can affect whether the bone uh, goes on to union. And then is there a stability issue? And so uh, not necessarily... Uh, it's just one of these at play when you're looking at a non-union. So you may have a fracture that has uh, inadequate stability, is potentially infected, and maybe due to some acute bone loss, uh, may have uh, areas of bone that have, have not healed. And so example on the right here shows an AP and a lateral radiograph of a young female uh, who was injured in a motor vehicle trauma was treated with a anti-grade nail for a closed oblique femur fracture. And this is our x-rays at eight months. And so while this is a closed fracture, there's no evidence of infection on lab workup. She's gone on to a non-union. So not all of these have perfect endings. I think when we look at non-union types, we have to think about uh, the, the types. And we're all familiar with radiographs that demonstrate a hypertrophic non-union, so those that have abundant callus but uh, very disorganized, the fracture looks like it's truly trying to heal. And in these situations, stability is really all that's needed. And so uh, these are probably the non-unions that we all wish we had because just providing uh, increased stability can uh, usually get these to uh, pass the finish line. The more challenging ones are the atrophic or oligotrophic fractures, which may demonstrate some attempt to heal, um, 
but haven't been able to. And so this is, in my mind, usually a situation where there's not only a biology issue, but also a stability issue. And so if you can do something to increase the stability of the non-union site and create some biology, some potential to heal, you can usually get these to uh, go on to union. I think with diaphyseal non-unions, uh, using the framework of hypertrophic and uh, atrophic slash oligotrophic, uh, there's a handful of different ways that surgeons will treat these. And so uh, this slide demonstrates just some of the techniques that are currently used, kind of from least invasive to most invasive uh, in order to get some of these challenging non-unions to uh, go on to final union. So nail dynamization, simply removing one of the interlocking bolts or uh, placing the interlocking bolts in a dynamic position will allow some compression with weight bearing. Exchange nailing is something that's been talked about. And again, I think the uh, results and the indications have been spoken about in the literature are a little bit varied because the situations in which exchange nailing is used are quite different. Again, for something like a hypertrophic non-union, this can be very successful, especially when the nail diameter is increased. Uh, but for an atrophic non-union, if there's been lack of healing in an, in an area, just exchange nailing itself may not get that fracture to heal. Bone grafting, uh, especially using autograft, provides uh, an improved biologic situation to an area of non-union. Compression plating, as we go back to our principles of primary uh, fracture treatment, compression uh, of a transverse or an oblique fracture can be very effective in terms of getting a fracture to, uh, to heal. And then uh, some other techniques and such as the Judea osteoperiosteal decortication or osteoperiosteal flap uh, has regained some popularity with regard to treatment of, of atrophic nine unions. So again, in kind of increasing level of uh, invasiveness and complexity, a uh, handful of different ways to treat uh, diaphyseal nine unions. I think we'd all agree that long bones, especially the tibia and the femur, like an intramedullary nail. For most fractures, like I said before, we're allowed uh, immediate weight bearing, or we allow our patients to have immediate weight bearing uh, after treatment with intramedullary nail. It's soft tissue friendly, so there doesn't need to be a large exposure for the vast majority of uh, these procedures. And previously, intramedullary nail could be quote unquote compressed. And so whether that's you know locking the nail uh, distally and then back slapping the nail to uh, better oppose the fracture edges, some nails allow compression through the insertion handle itself, or uh, after you've used an intramedullary nail in a situation of a non-union, again, placing a interlocking bolt in a dynamic position to uh, allow continued compression as the patient is weight bearing. Now, while each one of these can be used to provide compression, there's really no mechanism through these to maintain or control compression. And so I think this is one of the challenges uh, that we have. And so this is a patient of mine uh, who was referred to me with this x-ray on the left, a patient had a retrograde nail place and has a transverse metadiaphyseal distal third femur non-union and took the patient to the operating room, exchange nailed him, exchanged his retrograde nail, proximal locking screws were placed in a dynamic position. And a year later, you can see, still see that he has a non-union. So I exchange nailed his fracture, I locked him dynamically, and he's still ununited. And so again, not a single treatment method that works for all these patients. Non-unions really desire compression and stability. And so this decreases the gap that's present. It increases the inherent stability of the construct and stimulates fracture healing. And so with this in mind, looking for a way that we can utilize intramedullary nails for compression. So this first paper uh, that I'm going to review, and I'm not going to try to overload you all with a lot of literature, but just give you my thought process. This is the first paper that got me thought about uh, that got me thinking about ways that we could use intramedullary nails for non-union treatment. So this is uh, Walt Berkus in Journal Trauma 2008, did a biomechanical study looking at a transverse humeral shaft model with an osteotomy. It was a transverse osteotomy, and they had a load cell that they placed in between the two end, between the proximal and distal fragment. And so they used four modes of compression. They used an LCDC plate that was loaded eccentrically through the compression combi holes. They use that same plate with an articulated detensioning device and eccentric screw placement. And then they use a long humeral nail placed uh, through the intramedullary canal of the bone across the load cell. And then they use two different drivers in order to create compression. 
what you can see here on the top image is the setup that they had with regard to the load cell and the synthetic bone model. And the bottom portion of the slide shows the amount of compression that they were both able to generate initially and then at 60 seconds. And so they looked at the initial loading and then what amount of compression was able to be maintained after 60 seconds. And you can see with the intramedullary nail, with the small fragment screwdriver that they use for compression, they're able to generate a significant amount of compression, even more so than the dynamic compression plate, either eccentrically loaded with screws or with an articulated tensioning device, which is one of the classic ways that we're able to generate compression of a transverse fracture. In 2017, uh, Tracy Watson and Roy Sanders published this, um, this technique with regard to controlled compression for at-risk humeral shaft fractures. And they uh, identified some of the fractures that they thought uh, were at risk for not healing. And so folks who had failed a functional brace still had a significant amount of fracture gap, had deformity, or lack of healing effort. And so they used an intramedullary magnetic nail to an integrate technique, and then were able to compress these fractures to get them to heal. They had a compression protocol they described, and so they had an initial two-week clinic follow-up visit with compression until the gap was eliminated. And then once there was no gap in callus identified, they would follow these patients up, and so they would compress them uh, every three weeks, a third of a millimeter, until these folks went on to union. So they were using this anti-grade nail for folks that had at-risk fractures and getting them to heal. The New York group uh, subsequently published in 2019 the use of a magnetic intramedullary compression nail for long bone non-unions. And again, they had a, a series of 14 non-unions, five in the tibia, nine in the femur. Seven were described as atrophic, seven were normotrophic. The vast majority of them were diaphyseal. And their compression protocol uh, was based on the deflection or the bending that they saw in the interlocking bolts. And so there, we get these folks back essentially monthly and compress them until they st started to see some change in the position of the interlocking bolts. And they got 13, 14 of these folks to heal. They described their technique uh, with an open non-union takedown. They'd pre-distract the lengthening nail. They'd place cortical replacing screws in order to uh, prevent uh, end segment deformation with compression. They'd over ream the intramedullary canal by two millimeters and then uh, provide uh, compression in the operating room and then in the outpatient setting. This is an image taken from their paper showing the uh, fluoroscopic image of a lateral of the uh, distal third of the tibia on the left there and then on the right with regard to their compression using the intramedullary nail. This next image, uh, a series of three images from left to right showing the fracture gap proximally with the black arrow. The white arrow distally shows some uh, deflection that they saw with the interlocking bolts as they compressed through the magnetic nail. The middle image is a subsequent radiograph taken, which showed actually that even after compression, that there was some relaxation in the construct, and so that they went back and then recompressed through the nail again to the point where they started to see some deflection in the interlocking bolts to get this patient to go on to union. So showing their use of essentially a deflection index in the interlocking bolts to figure out how much compression was being generated by the intramedullary nail. So when do I consider a compression nail for a non-union? I think, uh, again, for hypertrophic non-unions, the situation of just creating stability uh, is, the, is the primary principle there. And so um, obviously, uh, in a transverse fracture that uh, has gone to hypertrophic non-union, uh, a medullary device which allows for compression increased stability would be optimal. Uh, but there are other techniques that I think that are very much uh, viable in that situation. In the situation of an atrophic or an oligotrophic non-union, uh, especially one that is recalcitrant or has proven itself to be recalcitrant, is really the prime patient in my mind. I want to make sure that I have about a half of a cortical circumference to compress, so whether it's in the femur or the tibia, because again, taking two pencil tips and trying to compress them is not as effective as taking two flat ends and trying to compress them. So I want to at least make sure that I have a half of a cortical circumference to compress. Again, I mentioned the recalcitrant non-unions are those that have had previous attempts that have failed to heal, especially in the diaphyseal and metadiaphyseal area. As you get into more proximal or distal end segments, you have to be very cognizant of the deformity that can occur when you're compressing a segment of proximal or distal femur or tibia and the deformation that can occur. So while you may get the patient to compress at the non-union site, you may induce a, a significant deformity if you don't have 
uh, cortical replacement screws placed uh, appropriately. And then I think the other thing that's really important is that the patient can't have such a large gap that they have a already noticeable limb length discrepancy. And so again, you're going to be shortening these patients, but if you're shortening them to the point where they end up with a limb length discrepancy, then you have to think about either future treatment to regain that discrepancy or talk to them upfront about the fact that they may need a shoe lift or something else after their treatment because their limb will be a bit shorter. So for me, the technique involves uh, an open non-union takedown, especially the ones that uh, have failed to heal or uh, have evidence of uh, potential scar tissue in the area of the fracture. Pre-distract the nail, and this is based on your preoperative plan to identify where the non-union is, how much you want to compress, uh, and then base your nail selection off of that. I overream by two millimeters. Depending on the patient and um, the appearance of the fracture, oftentimes we'll use autograft, and so I've gone to multiple places to use autograft, whether it's the iliac crest, the proximal tibia, distal femur, all these places have been used uh, in a handful of these cases for autograft. I'm gonna get compression in the operating room until there's cortical contact, and then bring them back approximately two weeks, and then every two to four weeks, compressing them either a quarter to a third of a millimeter until I see some bending in the interlocks or those patients have gone on to union. So that's kind of my general uh, approach to uh, this technique with uh, non-unions in, in the femur or in the tibia. So let's go through some cases. So first case is a 33 year old female one year out from a right closed femur fracture. Uh, the surgeon who had initially treated her at six months had taken out uh, some interlocks for nail dynamization. And she presented to me uh, with the images shown here. And so on the left, you have a uh, retrograde nail in place. You've seen that the distal interlocks are already been removed. Uh, the lateral shows the fracture line a little bit more clearly, but there hasn't been some effort with regard to healing some irregular bony edges. I didn't have the patient's initial injury film, so I don't know what area those are potentially just comminution or some actual healing effort in cal's formation. And then you see the standing AP radiographs that shows that the relative limb length is, is equal and that the alignment is essentially non-problematic in this patient. And so uh, for me, I removed the retrograde nail, then open non-union takedown uh, for this patient. So did a lateral approach with the elevation of the vastus lateralis, performed some decortication around the fracture, converted this patient to an anti-grade piriformis compression nail, and then brought her back every two weeks uh, until I started to see some slight deflection in the distal interlocks. And so this is what the patient looks like at one month. You can see some of the decortication that occurred on the lateral aspect of the femur. You can still see the fracture gap on the lateral plane radiograph here at one month. And then here the patient is at three months and the patient's already consolidated the lateral aspect of the non-union site. The anterior aspect is completely consolidated over and the posterior aspect where I think there was an area of posterior comminution is now completely healed. And I think more important than the radiographic outcome at three months was the fact that the patient for the first time in uh, over a year was now walking without an assist device was doing very well and was happy with her leg. And so actually this is the last image that I have from her healed at three months because uh, she has not returned to me. She lives a little bit farther away from uh, my practice setting. And so she has not been able to, to come back. Next patient is a 64 year old female with a history of recalcitrant left proximal femur non-union. And so she reports to me that uh, she's had multiple attempts over the um, probably a series of about 10 to 15 years uh, with regard to treating her femur non-union. So she presented to me with these images here. And so you can see an AP of the proximal and distal portion of the femur as well as a lateral view, which shows a proximal femoral locking plate. And you can see the non-union side pretty clearly there in the subtrochanteric region. Again, some healing effort is seen. You also see stigmata of the fact that the patient had a previous intramedullary nail, uh, which was placed. And so we did a complete non-union workup on her, which I, again, I think is essential for all these folks in addition to uh, whatever you think you're gonna do for them uh, in the operating room. And so we ran her, her calcium, and vitamin D, thyroid, uh, complete metabolic panel. Um, and uh, even though she was post-menopausal, uh, took that into consideration, but you felt like something needed to be done. You got a CT scan just to kind of clarify or, or further demonstrate the, uh, the non-union which was uh, present. And you can see that here on these coronal and sagittal cuts of the CT scan from her workup. So we took her to the operating room. I removed the proximal femoral locking plate. Again, given her age, wanted to make sure that we protected the proximal portion of the femur. And so you can see the 
two screws which are placed up into the femoral neck and head to do that. And then we converted her to an antegrade piriformis nail. And this was part of my plan, which was to take the plate off, do an open uh, takedown of the non-union, convert her to an antegrade nail, uh, and then again, compress her in the operating room and then perform compression in clinic. And so I did not use autograft on her. When I took her non-union down, I was actually pretty happy with the biology that was there. And uh, given the very transverse nature of her fracture pattern, I uh, thought that just compression alone would be allowing me, would allow me to get her uh, to heal. And so you see her one month here, and I don't have the images of the distal portion of the nail, but started to see a little bit of deflection and brought her back again, every two weeks, compressing her about a third of the millimeter every single time. And here she is now at four months, completely healed. And again, the x-rays uh, tell one story, but I think the patient will tell you a different story. And uh, that was really the most important thing for me is that a uh, patient for the first time in you know almost 15 years or so was, was now walking very comfortably, uh, had gotten rid of the walker that she had been on for a very long time, uh, and her radiographs uh, followed suit. The radiographs told the exact same story that she did. And transition now, uh, patient's a 49-year-old uh, female history of right uh, 3A open proximal tibia fracture, and this is all my doing, so everything from start to finish was me. And so taking this patient initially to the operating room, I actually had a floating knee and was nailed. And you see a small amount of varus malalignment in the radiograph there on the left, but decided that I was going to uh, treat with initial exchange nail with correction of the varus, perform a fibular osteotomy, and then exchange nail. And so I took the previous nail out, corrected the varus malalignment, uh, exchange nailed, and then did a fibular osteotomy. And uh, unfortunately, this patient's still now at you know, about six or eight months. Uh, it's not gone on to, to healing. And so now I had a, a non-union, had treated the patient for a non-union. This was recalcitrant, uh, or I had failed in my attempt to get the patient to heal. And so here are the images, the AP and lateral, now six months uh, status post exchange nailing, and still with a very easy identifiable non-union. So one that in my mind was very much a candidate for compression nailing, given the fact that I had already lost uh, once on this patient. And so plan for removal of the intramedullary nail, open takedown of the non-union. I use autograph from the area of the typical tibial tubercle on the contralateral proximal tibia. We performed a repeat uh, fibular osteotomy, which you see there on the AP and uh, lateral images. And then again, compressed in uh, the operating room until I had some initial cortical contact and then brought the patient back subsequent visits every uh, two to four weeks for continued compression. And you can see the radiographs here at one month, see the fracture gap starting to close. If you look closely, uh, based on the initial post-operative films in these films, you can see the amount of compression through the fibular osteotomy. Here we are now at uh, three months, uh, nearly uh, completely healed. And so again, finally, this patient uh, had gone on to, to healing of a fracture, uh, that had failed initial exchange nailing and uh, correction of alignment. And so the, the compression nail allowed me to control uh, my compression and uh, generate continuous compression, an area that um, had potential to heal, uh, but just had not made it over the edge. And so a difficult situation. Next case uh, is a 22 year old male, history of a right uh, 3A open distal tibial shaft fracture. This is a patient who was referred to me by an outside surgeon. And these are the injury AP and oblique radiographs on the left. Uh, again, the patient was treated with an intramedullary nail. And then the radiographs that the patient presented to me with are shown there on the right. And so the AP and the lateral view at nine months showing lack of healing at that fracture site. And so you can see the open injury there on the left. And so there's a lack of biology uh, for sure. We did a full infection workup for this patient. No other metabolic abnormalities. And so my plan uh, was removal of the intramedullary nail, take down the non-union uh, as described before, and then because of the lack of biology in the area, the posterior uh, cortex was just missing, place autographs in that area, uh, perform a fibular osteotomy, and then go forth with my standard OR compression until I had cortical contact, and then uh, continuous clinic compression every two to three weeks. The radiographs here at uh, one month would show compression, maintained alignment, so I'd see that anterior uh, aspect of the fracture starting to consolidate a little bit. You see that on the lateral side as well. The posterior bone graft, which had been placed previously, was starting to, to take as well. And then here you are at, uh, at three months with near complete healing of this fracture. And you can see the amount of callus formation that's actually demonstrated. And so even though 
we are generating continuous compression, these fractures, because they are stabilized with an intramedullary nail, uh, do demonstrate some callus formation, some relative uh, stability. But I think the, the compression and the bone grafting, especially in those that are uh, very much compromised, uh, can be quite effective for some of these uh, difficult cases. The last thing I'm gonna go on to is uh, one of the things that um, I think has some real promise with regard to use of a magnetic nail. And so we've talked a little bit about inline compression uh, for non-unions, especially in uh, diaphyseal and metadiaphyseal areas. But uh, when we start looking to non-unions that involve deformity as well, I think there's some real potential. And so I'm gonna go through this compression distraction at the site of a non-union um, in a case that we uh, just completed not too long ago. And this is a 66 year old female. I was actually on her way to uh, either her pre-op appointment for her left total knee or the actual surgery itself and took a trip and uh, ended up with a left distal femur fracture. So instead of getting her total knee, she ended up with a, a plated left distal femur fracture and was referred to me uh, at about 10 months uh, with these radiographs. And so the AP and lateral radiograph of a left distal femur. And so she had a supracondylar kind of distal metadiaphyseal fracture with this plate placement. And she had come to me with the, uh, with the notes from uh, either her surgeon or from somewhere else that says, uh, referral for exchange nailing or something very similar. Now, unfortunately, when you actually get the standing radiographs of this patient, you can see the amount of valgus and shortening uh, that occurred when her femur fracture was treated. So not only is her alignment altered, but also her left lower extremity uh, limb length. So I'd spoken to some of my joint arthroplasty partners and uh, they were neither excited or very enthusiastic about uh, taking on this amount of uh, valgus deformity and this amount of limb length and providing the patient with any sort of expectation that both would be uh, correctable in a single operation. We got a CT scan just to see better what was going on at that uh, supracondylar area. And you can see that the patient had not completely healed in this area. And so she had not only malalignment, but also a non-union. And so wanted to figure out the best way to get her treated. And so my thought uh, was to perform some uh, sort of osteotomy in the area of the distal femur, correct her alignment, get her stabilized, and then uh, try to utilize a magnetic nail in order to regain her length. And so this could be done either at the site of the osteotomy itself or a remote location. And so um, utilize the opportunity to do an acute correction, use the intramedullary nail to compress the osteotomy site, and then subsequently distract through that same area uh, to form some regenerate and help her regain her length. And so some select uh, fluoroscopic images of the case. And so we used a medial approach to the distal femur, performed a low energy closing wedge uh, osteotomy to align the left floor extremity. And you can see that there's a partially threaded chancepin in the distal segment in order to control that segment. And then in the middle fluoroscopic image, there is a uh, unicortical pin placed just within the femoral cortex to help me guide the uh, femoral shaft itself. And, and I did this in order to provide as much stability to the lower extremity uh, before I placed my nail. And so in the fluoroscopic image on the right shows placement of a retrograde femoral nail with the patient's limb alignment uh, corrected. And we used uh, intraoperative imaging to ensure that the mechanical and anatomic axis of the patient's uh, femur was correct before uh, placing the intramedullary nail. So again, my operative plan here that I went through is removal of the plate, medial closing wedge osteotomy, retrograde magnetic intramedullary nail, provide compression in the operating room in order to compress uh, that osteotomy site. And then after four weeks, start to distract her to get her length back. You can see the dramatic images here on the left and on the right, pre-op and post-op with regard to the patient's just visual limb alignment. And then these are our final AP and lateral uh, images. So I've given her five degrees of valgus. I have her nicely lined up on the lateral view and I have some cortical replacing screws because I am working in a end segment. So if I'm gonna be thinking about compression and subsequent distraction, I wanted to make sure that I control the position of that nail, especially in a patient who's a little bit older and who has also had a um, distal femoral locking plate in place with multiple screw paths through the distal end of the, uh, end of the femur.
So here we go. And so I've already compressed her non-union. Now I've started to distract. And these are AP and lateral images from clinic uh, showing some distraction. I did have to change one of the interlocking bolts out distally. Again, I think one of the interlocking bolts to the nail was through a path of a previous screw. So I had to change that out to a bolted uh, system. But now I've started to uh, distract and regain the patient's length. You can see the regenerate that's forming there on the right-hand image. And then these are her final uh, radiographs. And so I've been able to regain the vast majority of the patient's length. Haven't been able to change her uh, arthritis. And that's something that was just actually recently addressed by one of my partners and converting her over to a total knee arthroplasty. But you can see the, the nice regenerate that's formed on the uh, image on the right there uh, with regard to that kind of supracondylar distal metadiaphyseal area. And so that's all through acute deformity correction, compression at the osteotomy site, and then a subsequent distraction. So I think the benefits uh, really decrease surgical invasiveness. Uh, using an intramedullary nail, I think, in long bones is, is optimal. Um, the uh, new base of stride nail allows you to provide uh, these patients with clearance for immediate weight bearing, which is something that is really advantageous uh, for patients, especially after non-union surgery. Sometimes, you know, if we're using a plate, or not necessarily in a plate and plate nail combination, but if you're just using a plate, it may not allow these patients to weight bear fully on their constructs. It's all internal fixation. And so a lot of this compression can be done with uh, external fixation devices, um, uh, multi-ring fixators, but um, patients, I think if they could, would prefer not to have these devices on them for a long period of time and then waiting for those uh, devices to come off. One of the real beauties uh, is that you can maintain compression and as a surgeon, you can control it. And so whether it's utilizing the interlocking bolts to gauge the amount of compression that, that you're providing or dialing it in, increasing it, decreasing it, stopping it at your discretion uh, is very beneficial. We have an, uh, an ERC, an external remote control that's sitting in our clinic that we'll utilize for these patients. So, so the patients don't themselves don't have to go home with a, uh, a program or don't have to be doing daily um, uh, changes, especially in the setting of a non-union treatment. So if you're just bringing them back to clinic every two weeks, uh, you can control the amount of compression that you create. It's a de decreased refracture rate because, again, uh, we're using an intramedullary nail. Um, don't have to worry about uh, stigmata of a, uh, a previous hole or uh, outside of a plate or after a plate's been removed. And so the patients can... Uh, can have an intramedullary nail and that will uh, that really uh, provide them with limb stability that they notice kind of immediately and i think that goes along with um, the immediate weight bearing clearance that they they have cost i think is something that's uh, a worthwhile discussion because again um, while a single uh, non-union surgery uh, carries with it a a cost of uh, hospitalization and uh, device use if you have to go back on a non-union, say, for example, that patient who had the proximal third tibia non-union that I treated um, with an exchange nailing and then continued to follow that patient up and then had to bring them back at six months and then treat them for a non-union again. So now I've had multiple attempts at a non-union. That's multiple um, hospital stays, multiple, you know, uh, three to four hour periods in the operating room. And uh, also for the patient, you know, in terms of lost wages, lost um ability to get back to their, their job, provide for their family uh, or contribute, I think is very relevant. So that's something that I, I think is worthwhile uh, considering, especially for these patients who have had recalcitrant non-unions that have not responded to uh, conventional techniques before. And then again, the future of this, uh, not only in just transverse diaphyseal non-unions of the uh, tibia and the femur, but as we uh, understand the opportunities that are out there uh, using acute deformity correction, uh, potential compression at a osteotomy site, um, and then subsequent distraction I think is really exciting because for the vast majority of these patients, when you're performing some sort of closing wedge, osteotomy or realigning their limb, uh, this also affects the limb length. And so while there have been some descriptions of some very elegant uh, osteotomies that allow you to correct angulation and length. Uh, I think using an intramedullary nail, intramedullary nail to do both of them uh, can be very advantageous. So thank you very much for, uh, for bearing with me. I think it's uh, a lot of great discussion that has already taken place when I've uh, shown a handful of these cases and obviously uh, showing the literature that's out there, not the only um, uh, 
person who's been thinking about this because again, uh, I think with new technology opens up a lot of new horizons and uh, very excited about what the future brings. Thank you very much.